Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to my presentation, and thank you to all of you online. We're here together because we care about what's happening to planet Earth. If you watch the news, it's very disheartening, isn't it? And we can feel like, well, what can we do? There's nothing we can do. Well, I'm here to tell you that there is something we can do, and I'm going to ask you to join me, and we can do it together. I hope to inspire you. I hope to give you lots of ideas about what you can do and ideas that you can share with others, especially young people, because really it's their future that is being affected right now. So I subscribe to a lot of emails that give me daily inspiration. Um, and I do that because I also watch the news. It's really hard to watch the news and not have something to balance that out. One of the things that I subscribe to is inspiring quotes, and this happened to be the one today. Art is the one place we all turn to for solace. So throughout history, there have been many activists, and often art follows activism, and activism follows art, and they overlap with each other. Our heroes, our heroines, their passion is their superpower, their ability to speak up their ability to see what needs to be done and to take action instead of turning away without hope. This is a fiber art pieced quilt by Varushka Zarada of Joan of Arc. So I just wanna start out by saying you and your voice are critical now. This is not a time where any of us can stay back and let others solve the problems, right? We all need to get involved. There's so many ways to get involved. We can speak up, we can make art and a million other ways in between. So, you know, we see all of these, uh, these issues and also these victories that are occurring. Uh, the one that I'm most excited about is Los Angeles makes history by banning oil drilling and President Biden has banned oil drilling in Alaska. I just got back from a uh, bear camp, a wildlife photography trip in remote Alaska. So that's one that's really important to me. Down on the left side, you'll see some of the topics that we're going to cover here. Uh, perhaps you'll recognize yourself in one or more of them. Uh, many of these are things that I have experienced or pursued in the last 25 years as I have developed as an activist artist. So all around us, as we discuss what's happening to planet Earth, all around us we have images and colors and motifs and themes that can inspire us as artists and activists. We see these kind of maps. How does that make you feel when you see that? Does it make you feel hopeless? Does it make you feel angry? Does it make you take action perhaps? One of the, the habits that I've gotten into is when I see maps like this, I save them. I do a screen capture. If it's on TV, I take a picture with my phone quick. I have a whole file of these and they're, they're very inspiring to me when I think about what kind of art I wanna make to inspire other people. Here's another one. I know you, those of you in Colorado know exactly what this is. Uh, we've had a series of fires, especially over the last two years. In fact, I have a scratchy throat from the huge fire that we had two years ago. And uh, th this was a capture from those fires. You know, this is the expansion of ticks, uh, ticks from uh, the Eastern and the Northeast due to climate change. And so this is the kind of artwork that can come from those images. You know, this is someone's uh, view and it's very powerful, isn't it? There's so much emotion in this and yet it's just an image, right? But you feel the words, the emotion. We have images like this and images and colors like this that lead to artwork like this. When you look at this piece of textile art, you, you know exactly what it's about, right? Here's some photos from the fires that we've had here in Boulder. And here's a piece of artwork by a Colorado artist. Again, a piece of fiber art. 
So right now I'm really deeply immersed in the textile art or quilt art world. And of course there are many different ways of expressing uh, images and color and emotion and, and activism through many different types of visual art and other types of art. This is by an artist in British Columbia. And of course they've had plenty of fires there. This was her version of what it felt like and looked like to be in those fires. This is a photo I took. Uh, I live next to Celestial Seasonings. I went out and, you know, we had this big fire several months ago and took this photo. Whenever there's a fire, I take photos. That goes into my reference file as well. I have a really fat reference file, unfortunately. I recognized uh, many years ago that it was time to start saving these images. So what I found is when I go to art exhibits all over the country and indeed all over the world, artists are making pieces to express how they feel about what's happening. And of course you can read the artist statement here on the right. Uh, her issue here is that the seasons are really messed up. And when the skies are full of smoke or relentless rain, when we have flooding and hurricanes and you know, when Colorado skies are full of smoke that have come all the way from Canada or California uh, or the Southwest, it just feels like an apocalypse, but it's not. We have the power to take action, to speak up. A drought of honesty. These two pieces were from Quilt National. Uh, this is a very prestigious textile art exhibit that's at the Dairy Barn in Athens, Ohio. Nobody asked her to make this. You know, she made a piece for this very competitive, prestigious exhibit. She got into the exhibit and this was what she chose to share. Well, you may think that the war in Ukraine is not an environmental issue, but honestly, give it some thought. It's a horrendous environmental issue. Uh, the, the air, the water, the land is going to be poisoned there for a long time, but it's also full of images. And again, I've been saving images from Ukraine because there's some beautiful examples of artists expressing how they feel. Uh, just yesterday, I think, the Metropolitan Opera in New York announced that they are commissioning an opera to be written about abducted Ukrainian children. So, of course, when you talk about the arts and activism, we can talk about music as well, right? Here are some ways that artists have been expressing solidarity with the Ukrainian people. Uh, the tradition of painted Ukrainian eggs is expressed here with the image of a Ukrainian tractor pulling a Russian tank out of the field. And of course, street art and dance. The Ukrainian ballet dancers have found their way to other companies in Europe. Look in the reflection in the iris of the eye of the street art. I think this is St. Michael's Cathedral in Kyiv that's reflected in the eye. And what a poignant image. Again, it's street art. Somebody just took some paint and went and painted this on the wall, trying to stitch back together Ukraine, the people, the flag, literally and figuratively. Uh, in the middle here, here's a lady who is making art, making paintings and selling them to raise money for the pets that have been displaced and wounded and lost in Ukraine. So if you feel alone, you know, watching the news is pretty traumatic these days, but if you're watching the news and you feel alone, I'm telling you there are thousands and tens of thousands and millions and millions of people out there who feel just like you. We have to find our way to each other. I went to the climate march in New York City in 2014. It was one of the most 
energizing, empowering experiences I've ever had. There were 400,000 people who marched that day. I marched with them, and then after a while, I just stepped out, and I stepped up on a, you know, kind of a porch or some stairs and started taking photos just to document that day. And by the way, all these photos are on my Flickr photo site, if you're interested in seeing more. Pretty much every one of these photos, every one of these images is just a door that you can walk through. There's there's a whole chapter, a whole another story to share with each of them. And you can think about that in terms of your questions that you might want to ask. So if any of you are going to be in New York, September 17th, you too can join Climate March. Um, if I could, I would be there, but I hope that some of you will be able to attend it because it's an amazing experience. So artists are expressing these feelings and these ideas all around us all the time. So I'm gonna go through a series of slides here showing photographs of people protesting and the artwork to go with it. If you just Google online activist artwork, you will pull up these kinds of images. So here's a photo from the 60s. And here's the artwork expressing it on the bottom. You almost don't know where one ends and the other begins. Some things never change, right? The photos on the top, the artwork it is inspired on the bottom. You know, I can't remember if these are Russian or Ukrainian mothers, but they're protesting the war. I know that. And I really love this photo because they're all yelling. <laughs> it's time to do something right now. I mean, you can see that on their face, right? So how do you put that into artwork? And then, of course, we have the Black Lives Matter. And all of these human rights and social justice issues overlap with climate justice environmental justice issues, uh, brown, indigenous people, people living in poverty who can only afford to live next to Suncor, to a refinery. Um, in Houston, a lot of the neighborhoods of poverty are next to the, the huge refinery sites there. So these are all pieces of activist artwork. So look at these symbols and think about, is there something that you could bring into your artwork or into your activism using these images? They're powerful, aren't they? And I, I love this image of all of us standing together holding hands because that's how we create change. You know, for a while, uh, being an activist, being an environmental activist and other kind of activists where people would say to me, oh, you know, you can't say that. You shouldn't talk about that. It's, it's political. And my response these days is it's not political. It's ethical. It's moral. And it's time for us to step out of that, you know, inconvenient politicization and start speaking up for what's right, for endangered species, for children, et cetera. Boy, street art is just exploding. And of course, during COVID, I don't know if you're aware of this, there were many, many murals that were painted all over the world by artists, artists who had lost their jobs. And so, uh, you know, people who owned a building said, hey, let me hire this artist to create a beautiful mural and to give them some income. Cities had grant programs to hire artists to come and create murals. So, uh, I, I mean, I think you'll understand what we're looking at here in these images, but my favorite part is the backpack with the toilet roll <laughs> paper. <laughs> but here's one of our heroes. You know, Greta's amazing, and she has inspired many activist artists. And uh, the image on the right actually looks like a quilt. And, of course, the one on the left, you can see the polar bear down in the lower corner. 
polar bear is underwater, Greta's almost underwater. We, we can understand without words immediately what the artist is trying to convey. And that's the thing about activist art. You know, it delivers the message and it meets people where they are. It may punch you in the gut and may float over your head. It may just make you stop and think for a day or two. It may make you come back to it a, a week or a month later and go, oh, that's what the artist was trying to say. I've traveled up to Churchill six times um, to photograph the polar bears. And unfortunately, over 10 or 12 years, I've ended up documenting the decline of the population there. During the pandemic, they brought up a group of artists to create murals. And of course, most of those murals included polar bears. And so there's some information here. And of course, you can go back to the recording and pick up all of these references if you want to study uh, more about these particular murals in Churchill, which is in uh, Manitoba, northern Manitoba. Remember that, that image? Get rid of this. Uh, the image of the polar bear just clinging for dear life to the melting iceberg. So what a powerful image. And that's a great example of how you can take an image and turn it into all different kinds of art. I've been traveling up to Churchill, like I said, to photograph the polar bears. And the first time I went there, I saw 35 bears up close. The next time I went, I saw 25. Then it was 15. The last few times I went, I saw two bears up close and then one. That's pretty dramatic. I mean, we could still count bears off in the distance like a little grain of, of rice, you know, but it was, um, it was not the same experience as the first time I went. There was a mother bear who was lactating. She had lost her cub and she sat down right behind our truck. We were up on an elevated truck on the back uh, deck and she just looked so sad and forlorn. And she sat down right there and, and just like hung out with us for a while. And I had this experience, this incredible intimate experience. And because I knew how to dress, everybody else in the group ended up going back into the bus. So I ended up being by myself on the deck of the bus with this mother bear and having experienced lost a child some years before that, a baby at birth, uh, I could really relate to her. I just felt like we were having this very deep connection. And that was part of the catalyst of me deciding that I wanted to get more involved with activism. Here's another artist uh, who I've been following, Louis Masai. And this was part of a project at the Tower Hamlets in London and they, they just found an empty wall, a big, long, empty wall. And they brought a bunch of artists together and they all made art about endangered species. And, you know, you don't have to be an artist to do that. You can be the person who organizes it. You can be the person who gets the grant or gets uh, permission from the city or permission from the owner of the building or, or whatever it may be. You know, there are many layers of activism that go into a project like this, not just the person who shows up with the can of spray paint. This is an artist who I'm really appreciating. Patrick George, take a look at this poster on the left. Look how he's drawn in the invisible tusk and put on the end of it, not for sale. And he also is a children's book illustrator. So what a powerful way to, to tell a story without words. You know, particularly I'm thinking of this poster on the left. Well, children's illustration is another way that art and activism can overlap. And it's a really important uh, way of reaching the next generation. And there are lots of books out there like this. I mean, these are all about endangered species. God bless these illustrators and writers and publishers, you know, because the children's publishing world has been under a lot of duress over the last several years. And so to get a publisher to produce something like this is uh, perhaps difficult. And many artists are self-publishing. Sometimes that's what you have to do to get your message out. You don't wait for the big guys to, to give you uh, the thumbs up, you just go for it. Here are several books about women, about women activists, women artists. 
I don't know if you can see this over here on the right, but uh, I like that one, the pink hat. <laughs> and these are literary children's books about being an activist. I didn't know these existed. I started looking, oh, gee, that would be great if there were children's book for activists. And yes, they do exist. So what about craftivism, about activist quilts or activist textile art? This is a piece that I photographed at Quilt Canada in Vancouver um, a year ago, June. If there must be trouble, let it be in our day, so that our children may know peace. So one of the biggest trends in the arts today, including textile arts, is using images to convey a message. Yes, there is a trend of including words and phrases and letters and so on, but sometimes you don't even need that. You just need a powerful image. This is one of my favorite textile artists, Kestrel Mashad, who lives in Florida. So she is very familiar with this particular creature. Uh, this is another artist whose work I really admire, Sue Sherman lives in Canada. This was her piece in the uh, Quilt Canada a year ago. Now, Sue is a, a really a purist. She doesn't use anybody else's images. She only uses images that she has taken herself. So uh, I had lunch with her while I was in Canada, the last Quilt Canada, and she explained to me that she went to on a safari trip to Africa and she said, but the animals kept turning their backs to me. And I got all of these photographs with the back of the animals. And she said, you know, that made me think of making this piece where the animals are pretty much telling the humans, here's what we think of you, turning their back on us. See on the bottom, it says, dear humans. This is a large piece that was painted and stitched. This year at Quilt Canada, she won best of show. Uh, these are endangered species in the Anthropocene. So her idea for this piece was that in the future, if we don't do something, the animals, the endangered animals will live in a human constructed environment rather than living in the wild. And if we come in close, you can see the detail on the animals. But look in the background. You see the stitching in the background? She has stitched the names of all these endangered animals. So this is an example of a type of artwork that's really powerful. And I, I like to say, at least for textile art, there should be three levels of experience. You experience something from a distance and you say, ooh, that's really cool, what is that? You come closer, you start to see some of the individual design elements, and then you get really close and you see these little secret messages that are stitched into the piece. This is another piece that she made that won another prize at Quilt Canada. This is again, kind of a dystopian future for penguins, uh, tongue in cheek. So on the left, you see a coal burning fireplace that is uh, fueling an air conditioner that's being pumped into a geohesic dome sustaining penguins. God help us, I hope we don't get to that point. But this was her, here's some close-up photos. Um, you know, she's trying to tell us, if we, don't, if we don't do something quickly, this is where we're headed. Uh, one of the most well-known textile artists in my industry is Hollis Chatelaine. And she is another person who is, uh, feels very strongly about making pieces that that speak to you, that touch you very deeply. This is a huge piece. So when you see it, you feel like you're immersed in the forest. You're standing on the edge of uh, the swamp or the bayou. This is her statement about wetlands and pollution and development. But here's another piece that she made. And it's a great example of how sometimes a piece will help you to uh, get the message and feel something very deeply without words. And her artist statement said, where is the voice for African women and girls? Where is the voice for African elephants? Where's the compassion?
you know, for someone who's afraid to speak up in public, art is a great way to express something without having to get up and speak. And I, I thought this was a great expression of that emotion. And of course, the little creatures exhibit uh, that is going on at the Boulder Library that was mentioned earlier. Uh, these kind of pieces of artwork about pollinators, about bees and so on, this is happening all over the world. This is a piece that I photographed a couple of years ago in Birmingham, England at the largest, largest quilt show in Europe. But consider this, this is amazing. This is a woman who creates frames and embroidery, and then puts it in a beehive and lets the bees fill out the rest of the piece. Ava Roth. I, you know, the funny thing about these uh, presentations is you can add things to them constantly. I found this last night and went, oh my gosh, I gotta add this, this is incredible. Uh, Betty Busby is another artist who's also a friend of ours and this was a piece that she made about uh, Pakistani refugees called Morning Doves. And this was traveling in an exhibit called Forced to Flee that was about refugees. Here's a piece made by a Hungarian artist who lives in England. What's Extinction Mom? This artist, Kathy Nita, is uh, one of my favorite artists. She is a middle school science teacher. <laughs> and she makes these, uh, these pieces of art that are so full of contrast and movement. And here she's talking about, hey, we, you know, we live in this very polarized world, but it's still part of the yin and the yang, and we still have to learn how to work together and live together. Here's an artist who wanted to, originally the, the sculptor wanted to honor Lakota women and made this huge sculpture in South Dakota. And you can see behind her, she's holding a quilt, a star quilt. And when the wind blows, all the little triangles shimmer in the wind. And she inspired a quilt artist who then made this peace quilt called the Dignity Quilt. And this is the same quilt artist who made the Joan of Arc, by the way. So the Rhinoceros pro Project is one of my favorite uh, little topics because this is a group project that travels around from group to group and everybody works on it for a few hours and creates part of the embroidery of the final piece, which is the Albrecht Durer uh, rhinoceros, which was a, a woodcut engraving. You may recognize this. What a great way to bring community together. Here's some other examples of embroidery. You know, art doesn't have to be huge, it can be small. So in this case, we see that same image that we saw on the Ukrainian Easter egg. It's the Ukrainian tractor dragging the Russian tank out of the field. And on the right, we see another embroidery of a honeybee. And here is an example of an embroidery that really goes all out. She has embroidered the whole earth and the trees and the disintegrating trees, and it's unraveling at the bottom. And again, even if you don't see the name of it and read the artist statement, you still know what it's all about, right? For those of you watching who are textile artists, I wanna make sure that you know about Sacred Threads. This is a wonderful biannual show that invites artists to make pieces about, well, all of these topics that are listed here, peace, spirituality, grief, healing, joy, inspiration. Uh, this was the show that opened in Herndon, Virginia, near Washington, D.C., in July of last year. Uh, you'll see at the entrance to the show this quilt, which I brought here today. And here are a few of the other pieces that I really appreciated from this exhibit. The Hope Tree. 
and you'll see that she has stitched words of hope into all the branches and leaves and even the roots. There's that same uh, raised fist that we saw in some of the earlier artwork, but it's been stitched into a quilt. And again, she's worked in uh, the words courage, strength, and resilience. So this is an affirmation of her own strength. This artist really expresses how African elephants are disappearing from the landscape by literally having one side of the elephant dissolve into the blank background space. And sometimes we can make art that's more literal. Here's an orca. You may be aware that in Puget Sound, uh, there is an issue with the J-pod. The orca babies are not surviving. And of course, there are issues all over the world of uh, whales and dolphins being plowed into by boats or caught in nets and so on. And she has given us uh, the location of place by showing uh, Mount Rainier in the background. Um, this is an issue, uh, this, this is an image of refugees and it captures a moment in Pomerania in 1946, but we still see these issues today, or we still see these images today of people who have fled with just whatever they can carry on their back, having to leave their homes because of climate change or other disasters. So another way that art and activism uh, can be engaged with is by being a sponsor. And so I'm gonna give you some examples of uh, things that my company have done to support these kind of exhibits. So this was that exhibit about refugees called Forced to Flee. And we sponsored the exhibit in Europe where a lot of these refugees are fleeing to. We also have managed gathering and distributing and then working, uh, collaborating with nonprofits to have donated comfort quilts go to people who have lost their homes. So for instance, here's a batch of quilts that were donated by our customers. And on the left, uh, these are women in Nepal whose village was destroyed by the big earthquake there a few years ago. And those quilts were hand carried up by CU students in Engineers Without Borders, uh, hand carried up the little mountain trails because you can't get up there in a Jeep and they were given to mothers who had lost their homes, but had had babies in the last six months. And they had lost everything. When they received these quilts, that was a, you know, that was one of the few possessions they had at the time. So one of the things that we have done over 25 years is putting out calls. Every time there's a disaster, we put out a call. Does anybody, and actually our customers call us as well. For instance, uh, Lahaina recently, um, Hurricane Sandy, 9-11. We started this program with 9-11. I've really lost track. I mean, I just kind of add on a thousand quilts every time I know that we've gathered and dis distributed at least another thousand quilts. Uh, but we have um, gathered and distributed over 19,000, probably more like 20,000 comfort quilts. Uh, we sent 3,500 quilts to Japan after the earthquake and tsunami. Um, so this is just one batch of quilts before we packed it up and shipped it out. This is in our warehouse with our staff at the time. And we have to thank, of course, all the quilters who donate, who make and donate these quilts. It's pretty amazing. And so for somebody who's lost everything to receive a handmade quilt like this, often with a message stitched in the back, uh, it's, it's huge. Um, all, one of the other things that I have pursued is being an activist curator. And if you want to come back and review the recording, you can read my, my statement as the curator. Uh, there will, I've curated two really specific shows about climate change and the environment. And this one premiered at the International Quilt Museum, which is in Lincoln, Nebraska. And those two in the front, uh, one is a portrait of a mother gorilla by an Australian artist. And the one on the right is called Mother Earth. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. 
It was made by a Russian artist who had to flee to Ukraine and now she's in France. On the left, Susan's quilt is about wetlands and she had an artist statement about the importance of preserving wetlands. And on the right, Carol Breyer Fallert uh, made it. Here's another piece about the J-Pod, about the orcas in Puget Sound by Seattle. And if you're an artist, you know, making sure that you write in the artist statement can be another level of discovery for your viewers. Somebody may come by and say, oh, look, you know, whales, that's cool. And then you read the artist statement, you realize she's making a statement about the, the loss of habitat. I'm also, I, I guess I call it an activist collector. I buy pieces of artwork that maybe most people wouldn't think of buying. And the story with this piece is after so many mass shootings, I saw this piece and I approached the artist, Susan, and I said, you know, I really would like to own this piece. And you can see in the background, she was keeping a tally of the mass shootings. And she said, I really don't wanna make money uh, off of the sale of this piece, but let's make a deal. How about if you donate the purchase price to gun control organizations? I said, great, you got a deal. So that's how this piece came into my possession. This is a piece that I own uh, that is in memory of the Pulse nightclub mass shooting in Florida. And I wanna make you aware of Dr. Carolyn Maslumi, an amazing woman who's an artist, collector, curator, and so much more. She has been collecting quilts about black history all of her life. And she curated an exhibit at the International Quilt Museum. And it was, it was a very powerful exhibit it was one of those exhibits where people show up and they stand in front of pieces and they have tears running down their face. But you see the large piece in the back. Now just take a look at this image. Um, the large piece in the back, you can see to the left, there's a little bit of a quilt that says, don't shoot with a face mask. Now this is the piece. So Dr. Maslumi commissioned this piece and the artist made this. And this was about the George Floyd uh, protests that were going on. And when we get in close, you can see what I mean about you experience them from a distance, you come in closer and you start to see the elements and then you come in really close. And of course, look down at the bottom, all these sort of transparent layers of words and faces. This piece by Viola is about Katrina. And of course, when a hurricane comes in, there's an intersection between environmental justice and climate change. But it really captures the chaos of the moment. So over 25 years, I have donated to or collaborated with or produced art for many different nonprofits. This is just a quick overview of all of these organizations that I have uh, supported in one way or the other. One of them is Engineers Without Borders. You may know that it was founded by a CU engineering professor, Bernard Amade. And the way that I find out about them was not through Boulder, but it was actually at a conference where I met this guy on the left who is a, a rocket scientist for NASA. His name is uh, Dr. Jack Bacon. So through my association with Engineers Without Borders, both here at CU and at NASA in Houston, I was told a story about the friendship between Tom Stafford and Alexei Leonov, a cosmonaut and an astronaut. Their friendship was the foundation of the beginning of the space uh, station. And of course we know that things are kind of going south with that right now with the situation with Russia. But these two men had a very powerful friendship and that was the beginning of the peaceful collaboration with Russia on the space station for, for all these years. Uh, through and, and the point I'm trying to make here is artists, don't be afraid to reach out to nonprofits and to see what kind of art projects or other, you know, other projects, activist projects you might be able to get involved with, because these collaborations can lead to 
meeting some very interesting people. So for instance, Karen Nyberg uh, went up on the space station, I think twice. She's known as the quilting astronaut because she actually was sewing quilt blocks while she was floating. It's, it's the most viewed video I think of all time for NASA is Karen sitting there with her hair floating weightless in space, sewing a quilt block. And then there have been uh, books and quilt exhibits and so on based on uh, Karen, the quilting astronaut. She was also on the space station with uh, Ron Garan, who I met through Engineers Without Borders. And he actually lives here in Boulder and he has written uh, some books, including Orbital Perspective. Uh, did any of you see when, you know, Captain Kirk, Bill Shatner went up on the rocket and when he came back down, he was practically speechless about his 10 minute experience. Well, imagine being up on the space station for months and having that, that experience. So Ron has written about that in his book, Orbital Perspective. And he's the new CEO of a company called iSpace Inc. Uh, in South Denver. And that's, I, that, again, that's another rabbit hole, but he's off doing great things for our future on the moon with them. I also, a few years ago, met Victor Glover. And again, this is just through my collaboration with Engineers Without Borders. Uh, he's going to be the pilot to the Artemis II that's going to the moon, supposedly next year. Who'd have thunk? I never dreamt that I would have met a bunch of astronauts through my, my work. And also uh, through Bernard Amade, who is the founder of Engineers Without Borders, I was introduced to the Peace Tech Lab at the US Peace Institute in Washington, DC. And this piece called Mothers of the World is installed in their conference room, which makes me really happy because it's images, all these different uh, mothers and babies and children from around the world in their native costume. And it's in a conference room where everybody gets together and talks about how they can create peace through technology. So you may remember this uh, Gold King mine spill that happened near Durango and the Animas River. I'm sure you remember seeing these images of the, the water turning orange. Well, I made a quilt about that. And this is another example of how you can make a, a piece of art that has three levels of experience. And when you get really close to this and you look down at the bottom, you see that the orange water has flowed out of the mine into the river. It's poisoning the river. There are skulls in the river. Uh, things like arsenic and mercury and cadmium are flowing through the river. And also stitched into the river are the communities and waterways that are affected by this spill. So that piece was made for an exhibit called Water is Life that premiered at the United Nations in Geneva. This is the cultural attache. Um, and, and so as he was standing here shaking my hand, he leaned over and he said, you have to make more artwork like this. And it was kind of like a bolt out of the sky. I just realized, yeah, he's right, I do. So recently I received a packet in the mail from a fifth grade classroom. And again, I'll invite you to go back to the recording to read these, but these are letters that these fifth grade students wrote to me. They're so sweet. And the best part of it was I was able to set up a Zoom with the classroom several months later and the kids had prepared questions and they peppered me with all kinds of questions about being an artist and activist. And I, I will say that these letters are probably one of the, the most wonderful thing that I've experienced in, in my career, if you can put it that way, be, being an artist activist, because uh, getting this kind of response from a class full of kids, and you know, fifth grade kids are 10 years old, um, it's, it's a gift. And the quilt has actually gone on to the International Quilt Museum. It was acquired by the museum a couple of years ago, but first we used it to raise money for earthworks. And this is an interesting story. So I had committed to auctioning off this quilt to raise money for earthworks. And then the museum said, hey, we'd like to acquire the quilt. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, let me raise the money for earthworks first and then I will let them donate it to the museum. So that's what happened. I'm also an activist photographer. 
and I travel to wild places and take photos of endangered species when I have the opportunity. This is a photo that I took on my very first trip to Churchill. This is the quilt that I made. It's been traveling in an exhibit called Endangered Species. And there's a companion book. But you can see, again, look in the bottom. So first you see the bear, you see its face, you see it's called polar bear eclipsed. You see the eclipse in the sky. But look down at the bottom. You see the message there? The skulls, the poisons, the toxins, the chemicals that are stitched in. Uh, working with a polar bear researcher, I found out that when they find carcasses of bears and they analyze the carcass, they're finding they're just loaded with these chemicals that are causing genetic damage. I'm also an activist traveler. About every other time that I go up to Churchill, I take a group of people with me. Uh, I'm traveling with natural habitats. I just got back from bear camp in Alaska with them. But here are a few photos that I took when I was in Churchill. And natural habitats gives a percentage of every trip to the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, this is a piece that I made about, <laughs> about um, Washington, D.C. And when everybody was choosing their topic, uh, nobody wanted to do the White House. This was in the previous administration because they'd been told that they couldn't do anything political and nobody thought they could do the White House without making it political. I said, I'll do it. So this is called uh, Front Door, Back Door, Sunrise, Sunset. It's about how administrations come and go, but what the White House represents remains the same. And through my work, I was able to meet Jimmy Carter a few times, which is wonderful. If you think that the main work they do is Habitat for Humanity, I really urge you to go look up the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia. That's their true work. And that led to me making a portrait of Rosalind Carter. I asked for her to give me a photo of a, a moment in history that was important to her. This is when she spoke to Congress about the need for more funding for mental health care in the US. She was only the second first lady to speak to them. And this is the quilt that was made. You'll see at the top, the hashtag compassion is patriotic. I got in trouble for that, but that was before people realized that putting words in quilts was a trend. <laughs> and it's also on the cover of the companion book. And this traveled in an exhibit called Her Story. Get it? Not his story, but her story. And I have a piece that's currently in an exhibit called uh, Women's Voices that premiered at the Clinton Presidential Center last year. Uh, this is my piece, and it documents Hillary Clinton's famous speech about women's rights are human rights. And you can see she's wearing this iconic pink suit. Uh, the phrase women's rights are human rights is in 15 different languages, including Chinese and Japanese and Greek and everything in between. And I was really quite honored that a close-up of the embroidery, Women's Rights Are Human Rights, was featured on the cover of the show book, which is pretty cool. And here's the piece in the exhibit. Uh, the pink suit that she wore when she gave that speech was in a glass case to the left of it. And I, of course, I got to meet Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton. And that will be at the Houston Quilt Festival uh, November 1st. You know, you can also, as a designer or artist, create products where a percentage are dedicated to a nonprofit. So this is an example of something I did, gosh, 15 years ago, I think, that raised $27,000 for breast cancer research. And this is another example of my textile design. I actually cut one of these banners and I take it to uh, climate protests. And so I've been out there on the corner of Pearl and 28th with this banner. If you went past the protest, you may have seen me out there waving my banner. And then when it's time for me to go, I have scoped out the young person who's most enthusiastic and I give them the banner because I have more at home. <laughs> 
Now, this was a piece made by a Spanish artist from that banner. She cut out the earth and she created this image of a hand squeezing the earth and the oil is dripping out of it underneath. This is for an exhibit that I curated called Love Your Mother. And of course, this is the piece that I brought for you to see in person today, Stardust Mothers. You know, we're all just made of stardust, right? Are you aware of that? Generations of women who protect each other and the earth. And this piece has been in three shows so far. It will be at an exhibit at the DAR Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, it will be one of the few contemporary examples of craftivism. And here's a picture of this being photographed for Quilt Folk magazine right here on the CU campus. That magazine will be coming out with the background of the CU campus um, in the next few weeks. It was recently featured on the cover of a German magazine and I got a kick out of this. Um, they say Luana Rubin, power Frau mit großen Herz, power woman with a big heart. <laughs> and they had a whole article about my art and activism. This is the exhibit that it will be hanging with at the DAR. Now here's, here's that Mother Earth piece that was made by the Russian artist who fled to Ukraine and then to France. It was hanging an exhibit in France next to my piece. And another way that you can be an activist is to mentor artists who are making activist art. So this is somebody who I've supported and mentored and purchased this uh, Mother Earth piece that she made. And she'll be coming to the Houston Quilt Festival this year as well. So here's the piece that we referred to earlier, the Uncompagre Fritillary. This is an endangered butterfly that lives uh, precariously in the Uncompagre Peak area in Colorado. And if you live here in Boulder, I urge you to go see it in person. I haven't decided where it's gonna to travel to next, but I'm sure that will not be the last exhibit that it's uh, traveling with. So if you wonder about how these pieces are made, you can see those of you here in person, you can come and take a look at this afterwards. Uh, but these are entirely made from fabric and then they're stitched. Here's a picture of the piece installed at the library in Boulder. And of course, Endangered Species Coalition is our sponsor tonight along with Sierra Club. And I, I thank them for inviting me to speak and share these images and ideas with you. Uh, I apparently come from a long line of activists. When I started working on genealogy, continuing what my mother had started, I found out that one of my ancestors is Levi Coffin, who was the president of the Underground Railroad, helping escape slaves to uh, travel to the North and to new lives. And when I went to Dr. Carolyn Meslumi's exhibit, it, don't you love it when things come full circle? I discovered that somebody had made a quilt about Levi Coffin. So corporate activism, there are a lot of ways that companies can be active. Uh, we don't give 2% or any percentage of profit. We give 2% of all sales. It's actually quite a large percentage of our profit. But when you give a percentage of sales, it's a lot more black and white. And it's, it's a commitment that you have to keep. And that's why over 25 years, we have uh, all of all of the donations and so on that we've done have added up to $2 million, which, you know, frankly, myself, I still can't believe it. It's, it's an accomplishment that's uh, just over my head. And so I have to say that we've done it with all of our customers. These are all of the organizations that we give to. And if you would like to follow up and learn more about our work or see my photos from quilt shows or wilderness travel and so on, you can go to flickr.com. Uh, you can follow me on equilter.com. And we also have many videos and interviews. And so that is the end of my presentation. <laughs>